So welcome everyone to uh, talk three for Men's Health Week. So this afternoon, excited to have Dr. Jane Crow joining us. So Dr. Jane's a general practitioner with 26 years of experience in all aspects of primary care and extensive expertise in advanced prostate cancer. So 2011, she commenced working as a prostate cancer physician at the Australian Prostate Cancer Research Centre in Epworth in Melbourne. And the clinic's now a multidisciplinary clinic for men with advanced prostate cancer. So in this role, she sees men with advanced prostate cancer, often on androgen deprivation therapy or ADT. <clears throat> Dr. Crow maintains a clinical role, which entails monitoring and counselling men and their partners and the effects of ADT. She puts the cancer into perspective and in the context of any comorbid morbid conditions and their psychological situations. And she also participates in the multidisciplinary team meetings. She also is the co-convener of GP educational events um, and organised the inaugural Prostate World Congress in Melbourne, was, was on the committee. Yep. Um, and also has uh, very active in teaching future generations of GPs around prostate cancer screening and testing. So welcome, Jane. Thank you. So, Glad to be here, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> So with all, all that that's going on, the first question I've been asking everyone, but what do you do to keep fit and healthy? Well, um, number one, I, I sort of look to my parents. So number one, try to have good parents. So I'm pretty lucky in that thing. But for me, it really is a balance of all the basics in life. It's, it's, base, uh, it's, it's plenty of sleep. It's uh, plenty of exercise, uh, a healthy diet, uh, a good social life with family and friends. And um stress i mean if i feel stressed i need to address that so i've all got these little domains and if one domain's not right i've got to try and uh, balance it out and, and that sort of helps my health be as balanced and, and as good as possible so you're like you're sorting out the matrix essentially just... yeah that's right and if, if i'm in unbalanced i've got to find out where that balance is because if, if it's if it's sorry my phones have decided to go on thing um if, if my balance is out, then my health goes out. I'm not exercising or my, my, um, my diet might go off. So it's just a matter of trying to get that balance right. <laughs> and you've been at the Australian Prostate Centre since 2011. Can you yeah. briefly touch a bit further on your role there? Yeah, well, well, this is where a bit of a long answer to the short question. But basically, if you think that prostate cancer is driven by the male hormone testosterone and... So a lot of the treatment involves androgen deprivation or, or to reduce a man's testosterone. And that can be in the, at the startup was when having radiation or down the track if there's a recurrent prostate cancer after, you know, if it's ongoing prostate cancer after treatment, then androgen deprivation therapy is used. It's injections to reduce a man's testosterone and that will help reduce the activity of the prostate cancer. So that's all fine. Um, and urologists have been prescribing this for many years. But, but if you put a man on this treatment, there's a whole bucket load of symptoms and, and side effects that come with this treatment, like osteoporosis, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, depression and anxiety and mood disorders, sexual function, flushes, sweats, fatigue, uh, loss of muscle mass. There's a whole lot that comes with this treatment. And the urologists who are surgeons would think, well, you know, we'll put them out on the treatment and the GP will look after the rest. And the GP would say, well, you know, the surgeons have started this treatment. I'm sure they're looking after all these things when they weren't. So these men were falling in the gap. And so a surgeon came to me, uh, Tony Costello, who's like a, a pioneer of robotic surgery in Australia. He said, look, Jane, can you come and see my men and just bridge that gap, make sure they're being monitored for these side effects? Um, and uh, for the ADT, for the androgen deprivation. And GPs are perfectly placed to do this if they know, so long as they know what they're looking for. And then I'd say, see a man, look at their side effects, monitor them, manage them, talk to all their treating practitioners so it makes sure we're being coordinated and go from there. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Just, um, <laughs> no, I mean, it's just such a good, like, it just makes perfect sense. Like, you know, you. You always have like teamwork in, in medical professions just work so much better than um, you know, one person can never do it all because uh, you don't have enough time in a day or a week or a month to do it. And then we obviously don't want people falling through the cracks. So it just it yeah. makes such good sense. 
I totally agree with you, Tom. Mul uh, prostate cancer or any cancer is really multidisciplinary. It's using the strengths of all the specialists in allied health to um, get the best possible outcome for that patient. I mean, my aim is to get the best, poli best possible quality of life for that man for as long as possible. Yeah. yeah. And with prostate cancer, so what age should men begin to think about being screened for prostate cancer? Um, it depends on a few things. I mean, assuming a man has no symptoms and there's no family history of any cancer clusters or anything like that, probably around the age of 50, he should start talking to his GP. About, about the same time he starts having the, the bowel cancer checks, he should probably just talk about talking about prostate cancer. Yeah. And then if they've got a family history? Should... If there's a family history, uh, generally from the age of 40, it depends how strong it is, but in the 40s, the man should start talking to his GP about uh, being tested for prostate cancer. Yeah. And is that to, to help get a bit of a baseline for the PSA? I think we'll talk it's, a bit more about PSA later. But... Yeah, it's to have the conversation. I mean, uh, it, prostate cancer testing and in general practice has been very controversial for many, many years. So um, for many years, you know, for, for quite a while, we've been told not to test a man for prostate cancer, do not test because of, um, we were over treating, it was over diagnosis, over treatment. Um, but now as more and more evidence comes to light, there's now clear evidence that having the, being tested does uh, reduce a man's risk of dying from prostate cancer. But it comes with risks and, and you know, there's the side effects of treatment, all these things that go into it. So. I think I will never tell a man he should be tested, but I will tell a man to have the discussion so he's informed about it, and then he can then decide whether to proceed or not. It's up to him. It depends on what his values are as to whether he decides to proceed with testing. Yeah. And so it entails, from a GP perspective, usually two things. So the PSA, so that's looking at a specific antigen in the blood. Yeah. The P, well, okay, so if uh, the... Um, what I might do, if it's okay with you, I might pretend that you've come to me asking about should I be tested or not. Is that okay? And I can Perfect. do a whole, I'll give him a blurb. Give so, me the blurb. Give me the blurb. So basically, we know that from good evidence that if you test a man for, uh, or screen a man for prostate testing, that will reduce his risk of dying from prostate cancer. So if that's what your main aim is, then have, have the test. Um, Prostate cancer kills over 3,000 Australian men per year. It's about three to three and a half thousand. So it is, it is a major cause of death in Australian men. There are different types of prostate cancer. There's a harmless type that will never cause death or cause problems. And there's the harmful, aggressive type that will cause death. So we really want to catch these harmful ones and get them early with the PSA testing. Um, and there are some men that are great at risk of prostate cancer. They're men who um, uh, have a family history of prostate cancer, but also the other cancers, for example, the breast ovarian cancer, there's a bit of genetic cluster, um, or bowel cancer, pancreatic, that can be linked with prostate. Um, men of African-American descent have a high risk of the aggressive type of prostate cancer. Um, and as you get older, you just, men, the risk goes up. So that's, that's, that's the sort of, the picture of prostate cancer. So when we test for prostate cancer, the mainstay is the PSA test. The PSA is a protein that's made by the prostate and the prostate is a little gland sitting below the, um, the bladder. And uh, it, the PSA is not a specific prostate, uh, it's not a specific cancer test. It's a, it's a prostate test. So the, the, P, the prostate makes its PSA and if there's too much in your system, it just, triggers something is going on inside the prostate. It could be um, benign enlargement of the prostate, which is very common in men. It could be infection or inflammation of the prostate. It could be a low grade harmless cancer, which we don't really want to pick up, but it'll pick that up anyway. Or it could be the, the harmful, aggressive, nasty cancer. That's the one you do want to try and pick up and, and get it early. So that's what you do. So that's the PSA. So um, that's the blood test. Um, and the other part of the examination is called a DRE, a digital rectal examination. And this is where a doctor has a glove on and with, um, puts some lubricant on and, and inserts the finger into the back passage to examine the prostate because the prostate sits just in front of the rectum. And 
The doctor will then determine the size of the prostate, um, whether it is soft or hard or the consistency, whether it's lumpy or um, if it's smooth. It can, it's examination of the prostate health. So if a man wants to be tested for prostate cancer, PSA is the number one. Uh, the rectal examination, the most recent guidelines suggest it doesn't have to be done by the GP. So you'll get some GPs who will offer it and some won't. It should not be a barrier to a man wanting to be tested. So if a man thinks, oh, I can't handle that test, but I want to be tested, have the PSA test. You don't have to have the DRE. The DRE gives more information um, there. So that's what the PSA, if, so if the PSA is normal, no worries. If it's elevated, we'd repeat it. And, um, and if it's still elevated, I'd refer you to a urologist who would then, you would need a rectal examination. They will definitely want to examine the prostate. And often these days, a man will have an MRI to get a clear picture of the, um, the prostate to sort of see if there's any, you know, possibly cancer or size and give more information. And based on all that information that the, the urologist has, the question then will be whether he should have a biopsy or not. And a biopsy is when the urologist um, gets a sample of that prostate gland tissue and it's examined under a microscope. Um, so that, that the biopsy can, there are two ways. It can be, they can put little needles into the prostate, goes either via the rectum, called a transrectal biopsy, or through the skin between the anus and the penis, um, just in that area down in the pelvis, um, that's called a transperineal biopsy. And both of those, you know, they're not pleasant, can be bleeding, can be um, bruising, uh, can affect your erectile function for a while and your bladder flow. With the transrectal, uh, there's been, um, there's more risk of infection, which can land you back in hospital or see serious bleeding. So the biopsy itself can have side effects. And so long as the man knows what he's getting himself in for, uh, he can proceed. So, um, so once you've got the biopsy, the biopsy will then tell you, do you have cancer or not? So if, it is, if there is cancer, it will give you a grade, a grade from one to five. One is that very harmless, low grade one that will never spread. Um, and that's, that's one that does not need treatment. It will stay there. But the man will be checked regularly um, just in case there's, there's any reclassification of that cancer down the, downstream, which does trigger treatment. If it's a higher grade one, then uh, treatment to the prostate is usually advised because it can spread and can cause the, you know, the premature death. And this treatment would either be uh, surgery or radiation. And it's a good idea for the man to get an opinion from both specialists to work out um, what's involved, the side effects, the recovery for both side, sides, just so they, they're fully informed. Um, and so once they've had the treatment, then there were the side effects. So, and the side effects of these treatments can be erect, sex life is, is changed. Um, erectile function can be really, um, uh, can take a real hit. There can be some recovery with some help, but it's not, it depends on lots of things. You know, the age of the man, the type of, the type of the cancer, you may get erections back, you may not. Um, bladder control after surgery is, is lost for the first month or so, and then does uh, recover. Um, and but with radiation, you might lose it further down the track. So there's different types of side effects that need to be explained to the man and he needs to consider before he embarks on the treatment. So having said all that, Tom, you asked me to have the prostate test. If you have the PSA, if it's elevated, we're opening a can of worms. And that's the pathway that you'll be going down if you, uh, if you wish. You've just, you've just explained the whole thing. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's great because it just follows straight on from where Dr. Tang kind of started yesterday. So we've now just got the whole, whole passage all kind of, Sorted well, it. Yeah. It's, it's great. The, Thank uh, you. Well, I think it's really important for the man to be given the option. At least he can say, I know about it, but I don't want to. My values, some, some of my patients think their sexual health is so much more important than their, with their concern about prostate cancer. They say, no, nah, I don't want to have the test. And I say, that is fine. But at least you know about it. You've been offered it and it's, you're informed to either consent or refuse it. But that's fine. I don't like it when GPs refuse a man and say, no, no, I don't have it. It's a waste of time. It's, it's not fair to the man. Yeah. 
I'm just going to go back because I've got two quick questions that are like the sure. ones that most men worry about, or to a degree, with the whole testing thing. So the DRE, the digital rectal exam, firstly, what's, what position is the bloke in? And secondly, how long is the actual internal examination? Are we talking 30 seconds a minute? Oh, less than that. So basically, I ask the man to pop his trousers down. Lie, lie, I can ask him to lie on the couch on his left side so he faces the wall, brings his knees up. I've got the, the um, um, glove on with some gel and I say, okay, okay we're popping a finger in now. It would take 15, 20 seconds, maybe. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It froze a bit, but yeah, I heard mostly on the side, glove loop, about 20 seconds. On the side, about 15, 20 seconds. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. That's the question that most people want to know. <laughs> can you hear me all right? All right, I think we're back. I can, thank you, yes. Yeah. Um, so moving, moving on, because you've, you've nailed the whole journey, essentially. So the men that you see on hormone treatment and radiation treatment, what are the main health markers you keep an eye on and why? Okay, well, when um, I take a full history, I look at the whole patient and look at the prostate cancer in relation to the whole history. You know, that man's um, conditions and the social side. I always make sure they've got some, what, what are their supports? Because that's very important. Like, are they married or do they have children or friends or neighbours who, um, who can support them? Um, so on the hormone therapy specifically, I will um, I ask about the symptoms of sweats and flushes and how much bother that is. Uh, fatigue. I use the word bother because some people oh you get the sweats, but I can handle it. I, you know, I, I try and tease out how much of an issue it is for that person. Um, fatigue. There can be some memory. Uh, some guys just aren't as sharp cognitively, and um, and that, that can be quite distressing. But once you explain that and um, they, they feel a bit better. They're, they're not actually uh, uh, going through a dementing process. Um, I ask about weakness in their, when they're, you know, they're in their sport or if they're chopping or building or lifting, they can be a bit weaker. Um, and why I tell them, at least men can understand if they do suffer these symptoms, then they can, they can have some understanding of what's going on. Um, I ask, then I will ask about their mood because some men can get profoundly depressed or highly anxious or very angry on the hormone therapy. Um, I ask about cardiovascular risk factors. So I'll always check their, um, you know, their blood pressure, their weight every six months, uh, check their cholesterol. Um, um, I also will check uh, the diabetes, there's an increased risk of diabetes on hormone therapy, so I'll check the diabetes as a baseline. And the other thing I routinely do is a baseline DEXA, which is a bone density test, because these men are at, at risk of osteoporosis or thinning of the bones and fracture. So I'll do all these, and then um, I will always ask them to see an exercise physiologist, because an exercise physiologist uh, can prescribe an exercise program for that man that is safe, can take his cancer and other um, comorbidities into account. Um, and like I can refer to a psychologist if need be, or um, pelvic floor physio if continence is an issue. It's not hormone therapy, but that's part of the whole patient. So it's a whole, we just do the holistic sort of thing. Uh, all right. I think my last question for you was how often would you see the men? Uh, how uh, in the at the prostate centre? Do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Assuming all, all's well, I'll see the the man the first time. I'll review him in four to six weeks after he's had his bone density and blood tests and go over the results. Then, if all's well, may, uh, maybe every six months after that, or yeah. um, if there's not a lot, uh, if there are other issues, I might see him more frequently. And depending on whether he's got a GP, is also helping um, monitor these things. Yeah, okay, okay, awesome. 
Um, we're going to move away from the prostate for a little bit. And yep. so, given it's Men's Health Week, what other kind of proactive health screening tests should men be taking? So if we look at kind of 20s to 30s men to start with? Yeah. Um, oh, it, it's, I, you did give me all these age groups. It's kind of hard to do that. But I suppose in the younger men, um, I suppose I'm really worried about the mental health of, of younger men. There's lots of challenges and, and they're growing up and they're getting in relationships and vocations and lots of uh, challenges that um, they're facing. And some have really have, so this can bring out some anxiety or depressive symptoms. A lot of gaming, so don't get on games. <laughs> um, so I think mental health is really important for starting in the young men. Also, um, sexual health and S S um, sexual transmitted infections should be checked. Um, they should make sure they've got the hepatitis B vaccines at that age. Um, and also flu shot at any time, have the flu shots. <laughs> um, and as you get older, you know, I suppose 30s and also, I suppose the 20s and 30s, just talk about alcohol use, um, smoking and drug use and substance abuse. So just, just try and um, stop all of that. <laughs> um, as you get older, the, there's all, the, all of those things we talked about, plus really uh, exercise and lifestyles as you get older. So look after your cardiovascular health. So, um, so exercise, um, cardio and weights is really good. Um, also keep an eye on your mental health. It's so important. So I think if all of these age groups, if a guy could have a GP, they could just touch base with once a year. And every little, thing, every year uh, as, they, as you go through the journey, you can touch, um, tap into what needs to be checked. Um, in the 40s, um, maybe talking about um, mental health again. Um, maybe consider uh, prostate, depending on the family history, and 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 let make sure the GP knows of any changes in the family history. And when you hit fifty, well, definitely, you know, you make sure you have cholesterol, and you make sure your blood pressure is right, and your um, uh, bowel cancer checks, um, flu shots, definitely. Um, so ex once again, exercise, exercise, healthy diet, alcohol. Um, in moderation and no smoking and then as you go up a bit older than that pretty much the same I suppose when you're 65 you start having a pneumo uh, or now it's changed to 70 when you're 70 you have a pneumo pneumococcal vaccine and a shingles vaccine and you start testing for osteoporosis just in the general man um, um, but also I think I think the big message for a guy is just have a GP who, who you kind of get to know and you trust who gets to know you and you can talk about issues that could be fertility issues, they could be bladder issues, sexual issues, mental health issues, anything, just um, to keep as healthy as possible. Essentially, you know, try and find one that you get on well with and you have a good rapport with and stick with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't see different GPs at different um, clinics all the time because then your health becomes fragmented and your health is one of the most valuable assets you have. Um, and if you can look after it at all stages of your life, then it's a very good platform to in, have a good, healthy and uh, um, good quality of life. And talking about visiting the GP, why do you think men often avoid seeing their GP? Again, Jane. Can you hear me, Jane? I've lost you. No. Nope. Well, I think we're back. I got you. Yep. <laughs> uh, I was just asking, why do you think men often avoid seeing a GP? Beg your pardon? Why, why do you think uh, some men avoid seeing a GP, just generally? I think, it, I'm not sure. I just think, um, I think, I, I know women tend to see, well, they've always, women have tended to see GPs because of, they've gone for pill prescriptions or 
Um, they've taken the kids and it's become a very normal thing. And so they get a relationship with a GP and have an ongoing regular thing because men maybe weren't having those regular health checks as teenagers. Um, so seeing a GP was never quite on their radar. Um, maybe men tend to sort of, you know, the old male thing, I'll just suck it up and it's, uh, um, it's I'll be right. Yeah, I'll be right, mate. I don't need to check these things. Um, so there's a bit, I think there's a different uh, male brain, um, but, but those that men that do see their GPs regularly um, do have better outcomes, health outcomes. That's a, that's a good reason to go, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. Yes. If you want to live longer and have a better quality of life, check in with your GP once a year. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if guys sit around at having coffee talking about seeing the doctor as girls do. You know, they, they say, oh, yeah, I must go and check that out. Yeah. I don't know. Do, do guys do that? <laughs> I think not until something happens to a mate. So. Yes, I think you're right. There's, there's often a significant event that happens in the family or a friend that um, gets them to come to the GP. Yeah, or, or a local community event where a young guy has a heart attack or something and, they, and then everyone kind of freaks out because they can relate to him because yeah. they know him as a mate. Whereas otherwise it's just, no, nah, it doesn't happen in our community. That's right, exactly. It's head in the sand kind of uh, approach. <laughs> I'll leave you, uh, we've got a bit of an unstable internet connection, but I'll, I'll leave you, give you the final word. So it's a couple of final words just for men to keep healthy now and well into the future. What would you recommend? Have a GP. Go <laughs> once a year and get checked out. <laughs> simple, simple. Very right, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I'll let you get back to it, Jane. Um, I'll just uh, finish this up here and then we'll, uh, thanks for joining us. Everything's been, I'll have Thank to... you, Tom. Sorry about the unstable internet. No, that's all right. That's all right. I think we've, we've got, we've got most of it anyway. So thanks so much and I'll talk to you soon. You. Okay. See you. Thank you. Bye.